Welcome everyone. If you're just joining us, uh, we're planning to get started around 12.05, just giving uh, everyone a few minutes to get logged in. Okay, welcome everyone. I have 12.05, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to this Four Freedoms Town Hall on the carceral landscape and art as activism. This event is sponsored by Four Freedoms, the Cornell Museum of Fine Arts, and the UCF Art Gallery. I'm Rudy McDaniel, Director of the School of Visual Arts and Design, and it's my privilege to moderate today's discussion. The format is as follows. Our guest speakers, Gisela Carbonell, Carrie Watson, and Omari Booker, will introduce themselves and their work, and then we'll open it up for discussion. If you have questions or comments along the way, please uh, use the Q&A feature down at the bottom of your window, and uh, we will collect and compile those, and I will present those questions to the panelists. Just let them know um, to whom your questions are addressed. Now it's my, my pleasure to introduce our first panelist, Gisela Carbonell. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to be part of this panel and conversation. My name is Cisela Carbonell. I am the curator at the Cornell Fine Arts Museum at Rollins College in Winter Park, Florida. And um, today I'm going to tell you a little bit about Four Freedoms. This is a Four Freedoms town hall. This is the second um, in a series that we started at the Cornell earlier this year with the participation of um, uh, the UCF Art Gallery in partnership with Four Freedoms, which is an artist-led collective created in 2016, which appropriates the tools of political campaigns for, in a nonpartisan way, to encourage and stimulate um, participation in our democracy and creating civic discourse that seeks to involve creative people, artists, um, curators, um, people in all different fields, um, who want to be involved to pursue um, participation, engagement in our democracy and justice. And Four Freedoms was inspired by um, the 1941 State of the Union by President Roosevelt. And of course the images created by Norman Rock Rockwell to visualize those in 1943. Um, and uh, Four Freedoms has evolved in the last four years. Um, in 2020, because of everything that has been happening, this year, they have uh, fine-tuned the goals of the collective to focus on four important principles, awakening, justice, listening, and healing. And so uh, one of the founders of the collective, Hank Willis Thomas, is one of the artists included um, and represented in this exhibition. Um, this collective started, as I said, in 2016, founded by Hank Willis Thomas and also artist Eric Gottesman. And as of today, it is the largest artist collective um, in the US. So uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it to Carrie Watson and I'm happy to talk more about Four Freedoms um, later on in the panel. Thank you, Gisela. I'm Carrie Watson. Um, I'm an associate professor of art history at UCF. I'm also the founding director of the Florida Prison Education Project, which brings higher education opportunities to people incarcerated in Florida. And I'm the curator of Illuminating the Darkness, Our Carceral Landscape, uh, which is an exhibition which is on view right now at the UCF Art Gallery. And we also have an extensive uh, virtual 
uh, version of the exhibition that is available online through the UCF uh, Florida Prison Education Project website and through the UCF Art Gallery website. Um, so if you're not able to join us in person, you can see the exhibit online. Uh, if you do make it to the gallery though, you'll see um, the exhibition which features work by 25 artists from around the world, many of whom are either incarcerated or formally incarcerated, or whose work engages with um, the criminal justice system um, and uh, the lives of system impacted people. Um, so uh, we're really um, excited today uh, to get to have one of the artists uh, who's featured in this exhibition um, here today to talk to his about his work. And also um, one of the really, I think, important issues of the exhibition is looking at our current events um, and the Black Lives Matter movement um, and people coming together uh, to discuss these issues now. So uh, you can see this uh, photograph by uh, Christopher Etienne in the foreground, uh, the world is watching. Um, and also uh, next week we'll have a panel discussion with nine other artists uh, who are in this exhibition, all of whom were formerly incarcerated and talking about their work. Um, but right now today, again, I'm thrilled that we have with us um, Omari Booker, who can uh, share with us his, uh, the pieces that he's made for this exhibition. Thank you. And thank you, Carrie, for getting me involved initially with the project. It's been a couple of years now and, and really a, a pretty awesome journey getting to, to, um, well, to work with UCF and also getting to, to know the students that have been working in the, um, that have been working throughout this whole process. And, and I'm definitely humbled and, and grateful to be able to be someone that, that represents the incarcerated students that have done a lot of incredible work to, um, and that's the whole reason why we're we're all here. So, so yeah, thank you, Carrie and, and Gisela, of course. Um, thank you and Rudy also, and everybody that's here joining us. But my name is Omari Booker. I'm a studio artist that works out of Nashville, Tennessee, and I'm currently in Southern California, where where I'm I'm working on working in between the two spaces. But but yeah, I'm a painter for the most part, and my work is kind of organically moved into a social justice um, artists and activists um, realm, just as, as my own personal experience pushed me to, to look at those issues a lot more seriously. And just briefly, I was incarcerated in 2009 and had a 15 year um, prison sentence, which I'm currently finishing on parole. And yeah, I think a lot of the, the issues that we, that I care about more now I care about because of the experience that I had and, and being up close with the justice system. And the piece that you're looking at, All Lives Matter, question mark. It was in a series of works where I pretty much just didn't, I didn't use flesh tones, I just used blacks and whites. And, and on that toe tag on the toe, there's a question mark next to the All Lives Matter. And that was, it was created in 2017 in response to the All Lives Matter movement, which was in response to the Black Lives Matter movement, and and the reality that the lives of white people haven't been questioned in this country, and that was my response to when I heard All Lives Matter. I didn't disregard that. I'm like 100%. They do, but there's a certain population that is being killed, that's being disenfranchised, and that has consistently. Um, that's been the consistent narrative for so long that uh, that I don't think it, um, yeah, that it just didn't make sense that, that there was a question whether Black Lives Matter. And there's a companion piece to this that uses white flesh tones and has a period at the end of the, the statement. And, and I, that, that's really what was going on with this, with this work. And I think what's going on in the movement right now is sparked by Ahmaud Arbery and George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, but especially George Floyd. We were in the midst of a pandemic, the world was shut down and we watched somebody be killed. Um, and I think then everyone realized, oh man, we better start saying Black Lives Matter because look at the example that we all had to watch because there was no college football coming. There was no Major League Baseball coming. We were often at home watching this happen. So so yeah, that's, that's what that piece is about. Yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah, um, exactly. Omari. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, no. I was just, I was just kind of turning it over to you. <laughs> oh, I was going to ask. Um, 
when we're thinking about, you know, what's happening or what has been happening this year with Black Lives Matter, like you were saying, that sometimes we hear people talk about these events, you know, and from the artist perspective, it may be different, but people talk about these events um, sort of in a vacuum, right? And, and these things are not happening in a vacuum. There is, uh, I wonder, and if you think about the connection with um, slavery and also what's happening now and mass, mass incarceration as issues that are all perhaps symptoms of one another or connected, um, um, in some way that comes through in your work and, and why is that important? Because I feel sometimes in these discussions, you know, we lose sight of the historical context and, and that is key in order for us to work through what's happening now and, and be able to move forward. And I think that's why your work and the work of all the other artists in this exhibition, um, it's so important in shedding light on these issues. So I was wondering how, how you connect all of these different things in your work. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the historical context is is vital because we we didn't just show up here. You know, there was something that that happened that made there be a need for a Black Lives Matter movement, and that was the reality that Black people in not too far back history weren't human beings. They were three fifths of a person, and then before that. Um, property, you know, the most valuable property in the United States, but still property. So, so yeah, that, um, and, and I think the, the connection to slavery is probably the biggest missing link in as, in as much as people that I've worked with and some, I think people across the board, black people, white people, um, but as much as, as, as we try to put that in a box of it happened a long time ago, it is, I mean, from my perspective, the, the most important aspect of the issue that we're dealing with today and the reality that we never, that we never dealt with it honestly. Like we never really opened the wound and said, okay, this is the, the cancer that, that helped create this country and it also helps create this issue. Now, how are we going to really honestly look at that and deal with it? And um, and and so so yeah, absolutely. I mean, so I think that you know, slavery to Jim Crow to the drug war to redlining, which the peace rebel that you're looking at is is I'm discussing redlining and redlining is discriminatory housing practices around the 1940s that separated real estate and and how um, and how that and how those laws, you know, coming out of coming out of slavery and coming out of Reconstruction, how those laws really cemented the the economic structure of the of the United States. And so, so yeah, having this having this um, soldier for one that, that this um, that this that he is a, he is a soldier in this piece, but he also was. Well, he was a former slave as well, so he was kind of a decorated soldier, but he didn't have the rights as a human. But he did save the lives of a lot of of a lot of Confederate <laughs> soldiers. Um, so just all of the interesting, um, I don't know if you'd even call them contradictions, just how all of it wove together and and how connected we really all are in the history in the, in the history of the United States, which is really unique, um, has to kind of be looked at honestly. And because it's never really been looked at honestly, we keep repeating the same problems, the same issues. And what I've, you know, what I've asked, you know, white co-conspirators, white people that have decided, okay, I want to join this movement, um, is to really look at what ways I participate as a white person, as a black person, as a business person. What are the ways that I participate? You know, in in things like redlining. If I'm in real estate, I have some potential to rent a home to a Hispanic family or to a black family or to a a Muslim, whatever the thing is, to start breaking these things up. Um, we can choose to send our children to schools that have similar economic opportunities um and so so yeah that's kind of what this was about that red line series touches on a lot of different things but this was was the the piece that that um that, that now lives at ucf and that um that 
that was definitely spoke to the transition between Confederacy, slavery, and um, and then that separation of of black and white. And that's what the flesh tones are about. And why there's a dark flesh tone in the middle and a lighter flesh tone on the outside is because that separation is really cemented and and I think we, we kind of have to go back and look at, at how deep and how cemented that separation is. It's cemented, it's, it's separated by a razor wire, like visceral thing. And I think when people look at the police force and try to point the finger, like that this police force is doing that. No, we, we selected them to be the ones to cement this separation. And so the guy that kills George Floyd, he's doing his job. Like we put him in the position to do that intentionally and always have. And so that's, that's the, you know, that's, that's the crux of it from my perspective. Yeah, I think that's such a great point that it isn't um, bad apples, right? It's not a few bad actors uh, that are uh, perpetuating um, violence against people of color, but instead is our system, right? It's our systems of power and um, injustice, uh, it, including, you know, higher education, right? As an institution, predominantly white PWI institutions, right? Uh, and the systems that we perpetrate and are involved in as well. Yeah, um, we're thrilled at uh, the Florida Prison Education Project to get to have this piece in our permanent collection now. Um, it's such a very powerful piece, I think. Um, and uh, as Omari mentioned, uh, this, this exhibition and um, us meeting each other and, and um, getting to work together has been a, a really a two year project that's been funded by the National Endowment for the Arts uh, that has brought um, artists to um, Orlando and to Central Florida to go into the prisons and to teach art classes um, and to also have some of our students work exhibited uh, from those art classes. So that has been a really important part of the project and um, also to, to keep this dialogue going. Um, Omari, I was, when you were talking and we were you know, thinking about uh, systems uh, of, of power and injustice um, and going from slavery uh, to Jim Crow, to redlining, to mass incarceration. Uh, we of course think about uh, our criminal justice system and the courts, right? The judiciary and the way in which sentencing laws that had been enacted really after the civil rights movement um, and then as part of tough on crime. Uh, first after slavery, right? Uh, we mass building of prisons uh, in order to incarcerate people who had uh, after emancipation and then after the civil rights movement once again uh, a mass incarceration of people of color um, and i was wondering if you might talk a little bit about um about this about the relationship between the legislature and the judiciary and our court system and mandatory minimum sentencing um and these laws yeah absolutely um and and again there there are a lot of things that I didn't have a lot of awareness of until I was directly in them. Um, and just sort of my background, I went to a, an all male high school in Nashville, Tennessee, um, played college basketball. So I was a high school state MVP and then went and played for another um, a division one school. And so I didn't really have a lot of understanding that this was happening. I was, you know, someone that was, you know, I mean, I was in my own bubble in, in that, in that regard of being sort of, I, sort of, um, I wouldn't say protected, but yeah, but just not being aware, not being aware of a lot of things that, um, that I think, that I think a lot of us aren't unless we're, we're in the system or close to it or have some family in it. But yeah, that, this piece, Reasonable Doubt that you're looking at um, was just my interpretation of the justice system when you're actually in court and when you think about mandatory minimums, um, a class A drug felony in Tennessee, the minimum is 15 years and the maximum is 60 years. So as a first offense, nonviolent drug offender, I mean, my, my minimum was 15 years. And so I could either take the plea for the minimum or I could go to trial and likely get anywhere from that 35 to 60 range, which was the, the people that I knew that went to trial, kind of got punished for going to trial. So that was the, I think when you, when you kind of put in context, the amount of time that is, that is kind of taken out of someone's life, and then the effect of that on family and resources and just reentry, all of, all of the, the things, those, um, yeah, those minimums are, 
are huge and the and the lack of flexibility um, that that the justice system kind of offers uh Brian Stevens and just mercy where it's like mercy being a part of justice is a reality and in the racial component, I witnessed that with guys that that I got in trouble with that were white and Mexican and black and like there were there were there was a couple of people who all had sub- significantly different outcomes and the only difference was was race and in my personal and that was that was my personal experience where a white a white um co-defendant got probation another guy got a business card to his door the Mexican got 11 years I got 15 years <laughs> you know and this is a, a very specific um and so I don't I don't often use my own personal experience as as a way of discussing it because it's so much bigger than my personal experience. It is the reality that one in three black men will go to jail or prison in their in their life if you're in the United States. Um, and so it's, but but it is that reality that uh, that in the justice system, this is how it felt to me. It felt like a defendant um, with no jury because the jury is doesn't really matter no judge the judge doesn't really matter the the gallery that doesn't really matter it's it's all i mean it's a theater performance (laughs) you know it's pretty much you and whatever is predetermined to happen and um and so so yeah that's what reasonable doubt that's kind of where that piece came from and the and the idea for the title of the piece was from jay-z's first album i'm a huge hip-hop fan and uh and his first album came out when i was 16 and uh and so so reasonable doubt was the title of the album and it was sort of telling his story of being in between the justice system and a music career where i think when when we do see examples of people that find their creative outlet how they can soar versus creatively being an entrepreneur in drugs or in whatever the thing is that is most available for whatever reason um and and so so yeah so he was a huge influence when I um even just witnessing where he was in ninety three ninety four you know everybody getting indicted around him and the whole thing kind of caving in on him to go ahead and putting all of his energy into music and I feel like I put my energy into art in the in a in a pretty similar pretty similar way and and um and to this point it's been yeah I'm, I'm extremely grateful you know all of these people that are here are are in the arts in some form or fashion and I am yeah it, it, it saved my life I'm I am eternally eternally grateful for for that medium to express these these thoughts and feelings and um yeah it's, it's, it's a great place to land um I wonder if you can talk a little bit about you know as I was looking at this image and and looking at this solitary figure like the most prominent figure here um, and also thinking about the effects of uh, of this in families and in communities, not only in terms of incar- mass incarceration, but also, you know, as we have been seeing the events evolving this year, um, most recently, I think in uh, Wisconsin and how, you know, the 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 relationship with police or the relationship with other Um, figures of authority and communities have in the larger structures and relationships in those communities. And I wonder, you know, as I was looking at works like Reasonable Doubt and thinking about um, the official um, structure, social and political structures, right? And and, uh, in terms of of law enforcement, um, how do you see that? And if that's something that comes through in, in other works in your art and in the exhibition, in terms of the impact uh, of these laws and these, like you were saying, predetermined sentences and how they are applied to uh, black men in many cases. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, I, and there's plenty more images, but definitely the, the effects on family and, and this, this young man in particular, that's my little cousin who is actually in Trinidad where my mom is from and it this kind of was sparked by a i mean i'm sure most people know about carnival in trinidad but they they celebrate everything and dress up for all kinds of different different events and whatnot but he had one costume day where he went to school as a police officer 
and my other cousin, his mom posted it on social media. And I kind of had this recoil of what are you doing? Dressing him up as a police officer. <laughs> and, and it kind of didn't resonate until a second later that, oh, he's in Trinidad. Their relationship with, with law enforcement is completely different than our relationship with law enforcement here. It is um, kind of, at least from my experiences, as soon as I was old enough to understand that, that I was a person, as long as I can really remember, there's been a, a, a distrust of law enforcement, more of a, you have to learn how to navigate these people. This isn't like, a, this is, they're not meant to, to help. They're just meant for you to stay out of their way and not get, um, you know, punished or killed or harassed or whatever. Um, turn your music down, pull your pants up, all the stuff that, that, as, a, that as a black boy, you're taught to um, just to navigate. And so, so yeah, so this, this particular piece, um, Pick Every Lock just had the idea of, of finding a way of getting youth out of that system. And, and that's been a big part of my work just over the years of working with um, juveniles that have been in some sort of trouble or, or just, just youth in general, you know, trying to build, build some, I think, self-esteem is kind of the thing that I always start with, but trying to build some resilience to, to not be in the same position that their parents are in, while also understand, or their parents have been in potentially, while understanding that it's, it affects everybody regardless. I mean, when one person in a family is incarcerated, the, the partner of that person is driving hours to visit and spending money to put, get on the phone to eat, you you can't as a as a six foot eight, two hundred and twenty pound man, <laughs> you are uh, you there isn't enough food that is that is given. So so families are consistently re you know, sending different resources, sending money for commissary. Um so yeah, it's definitely a um it's a it's a reality thing that the entire family is incarcerated when when one person is. And, and visitation galleries always have a, a bunch of children. You know, there's there's always guys that their kids come every weekend with their partner, and sometimes it's still their partner. Sometimes it is a, a an ex-wife or an ex-girlfriend who just is that invested in the kids, still having that time with their dad. So, so yeah, I mean, it's it's it is it's a really um, it does. I mean, the, the entire family is affected and. And we could just that that could be a whole nother panel on how that affects the entire community and the kids and watching your mom get searched and then you yourself being searched to go into an institution to to you know spend those those still really joyful hours with your dad, which is the other kind of cool thing that I got to watch was how much a kid is just a kid with their dad, no matter what the circumstance and so so yeah that that is it's a um some, some really unique challenges on the family. Yeah, I just read um, a study that was done at Cornell um, that one in five Americans have a family member uh, who has been incarcerated or is incarcerated. Um, and you think about um, the impact on our society, right? This notion that the carceral landscape is not something that's over there, that's inside, but it's everywhere, right? It's affecting all of us in our lives. I really love, Amari, um, in this painting, the way you have really made the child so vibrant and full of life and color, uh, whereas uh, the the figure that I read as, as his father uh, as is, is in, in black and white, he's, he's behind bars, he's in this um, almost ghostly realm um, behind him. Uh, and I was uh, thinking of another painting that you've made, uh, a self-portrait that um, is the next slide that is showing uh, your image of yourself um, incarcerated. And um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about um, this piece and um, what, uh, prompted you to make it um yeah absolutely and and i think that you know I, I, the thing they're not always intentional when you make artwork but it's always intentional there's always something that is 
that is spurring you to kind of make this decisions about colors and and what is the foreground and what's the background. But the the child in the last slide, I, I definitely, you know, that's the hope. You know, that's the potential of of mass people understanding this issue is that that the child can be vibrant and can be in color and can live a life that I think every generation, you know, if, if we're doing our job, every generation has that hope of, you know, the 60s and 70s had the hope of the 80s and 90s, the 80s and 90s have the hope of the, the 2000s, 2020. And so, so yeah, I, I, that's the, I think that is the reality that, that this child can be in a different position if we're intentional about making that happen. So absolutely. And uh, yeah, the last piece that was, uh, that was created this year. So around when COVID started, and it was created with the intention of this, of this exhibit at UCF. And it's a eight by eight foot um, self portrait. And I, I reconstructed my style, basically. I did, you know, made a little diorama and, and just kind of went, went there, went to, went to, to the space that, that I was for such a long time. And that was the very, um, yeah, that posture was the posture that I was often in kind of sitting on the, on the bottom bunk or top bunk and a letter in my hand that I was either about to read or just read. And, and so that, that was, was definitely a, you know, challenging, but really cathartic. Uh, that's when I talk about the gratitude that I have for art, that is, that's one of those things that there's not a lot of spaces that I could get into that in the way that I got into it and emotionally kind of cleanse some of that stuff. And in the actual, I wrote a poem that goes along with that, that I wrote in 2012 while I was incarcerated. And I created this piece as COVID was beginning too. So it was also a really interesting reality of sort of being sheltered in place and uh, and then going back to the last time that that I was also isolated in a in a in a much different way than than right now but but there there were the, there were the similarities also to um yeah and I think a lot of people have felt is felt the challenges of COVID but have also felt some spiritual growth and some and some yeah some settling into into self so but I'll share the poem the poem is actually about the bird that's in the window to the top left and the bird would show up really regularly. And I started off with a bit of a conversation with it. And then it ended up being a, I ended up writing a little, a little poem. So this black bird, this black bird lands in my window. The same bird every morning. I guess it's the same. All I've seen is its shadow, but it says hello every day, every morning. I fly away with my little black friend every day, every morning. My mind on its back, free on its wings, so I only see it through bars, we meet at the screen. It visits me every morning, every day. It brings me hope, it feeds my dreams. They're only bars, they're only screens. It's only tears, it's only screams. And to be born, we need these things. It brings me hope. It feeds my dreams. They're only bars. They're only screens. It's only tears. It's only screams. And to be born, we need these things. So for now, I guess I'm free. My little black friend, it visits me every morning, every day. So yeah. Yeah, I just thank you so much for sharing that Omari with all of us who are here with you today. And, you know, it's just another a reaffirmation of the power of art um, and of creativity in all kinds of different challenging moments. And, and you know, the, I just wanted to interject here that, you know, the, the creation of, of a painting like this one and that poem and that story and the significance of it when we think about what freedom means to different people at different times, um, you know, the discussions that For Freedoms is having this year, for instance, about what freedom means 
to different people at different moments in time and, and throughout history and to think about the power that these words and this image can have, not just for your own healing and for your own moving forward, right? Um, but also for those of us who may have had different, different experiences to learn from your own experience and to help our community see from a different perspective, which of course is the, the greatest power that art can have and could give us as a community. So thank you so much for that. Thank you, thank you, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much, Amari. That was really beautiful and appreciate you sharing your work and telling us about your, your voyage. And thank you also, Gisela, for that wonderful summary. So we have about 20 minutes left and we have some really great questions that have been submitted from our attendees. Um, so I'll just go and start with the most upvoted questions and we'll see how many of these we can get through. Um, so the first question for Omari, how many people have seen your paintings? Do you know the level of impact the paintings have had in the community? And have you seen any political reform result from your work? Yeah, that's a um, great question. You know, how many people I would say not enough. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I'm not, I'm not sure as far as how many people I think, you know, in, in my direct community in Nashville, um, I, they, they've, they've gotten pretty, um, pretty broad there and, and, and then some in some other areas. And so, so it's gotten some good exposure. And I think as far as impact, art is such an interesting, interesting thing in, in how it impacts, you know, I, I don't think I think I often see the impact a little bit less, even though I've I, I have been able to 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 talk to legislature and and, and see some things that have, have tangibly been done. Um, I think it plants a lot of seeds. You know, I think art art plants a lot of seeds, and um, and and then it's then you hope that people you hope that it resonates. Uh, you know, the the thing that I do like about it is that it takes me out of the equation a little bit. And sometimes when I'm directly speaking to someone and telling them, think this way, vote this way, do this thing, they get so armored up that it goes over their head. But we did a, um, we did a panel around that redlining issue. And, and I think because people were looking at the artwork and seeing how it, how it spoke to them, you know, the artwork is more of a mirror instead of, an individual telling them a way to, to think or act. So, so I think there's tremendous power and I, and I think it's power that, that I will never know and, and I'm gonna keep on making the work anyway. <laughs> yeah. I think the, the next question sort of relates to that and uh, it really has to do with the deliberation of the emphasis on message found in your art. And the question is, is it just the organic outgrowth of experience and inspiration, or do you feel obligated to speak to the issues of the moment? And if so, is it a heavy burden? Yeah, it's um, it's not a heavy burden, definitely. It's um, I do feel some responsibility, and it's also organic. I mean, it's a natural. I think we all kind of have that 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 thing that we're that we're placed to to do and be and. You know, incarceration is as much as I fight against what the system does and what the system means. I also understand that um, that that was the time that that I needed. That's no, and that is that's that's not to lift up the system. That it's just the reality of you kind of are placed in a. Um, it was a it was a container that that allowed me to really understand the 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 place that that I needed to occupy in the world. So. So yeah, I think that the messaging, I absolutely feel, and I wouldn't call it, I would call it calls more than an obligation. Um, you know, the people that I most looked up to when I, when I read James Baldwin, when I listen to Malcolm X, when I listen to Nipsey Hussle, when I listen to, you know, Martin Luther King Jr., any, any of the people that I'm, I, I see how much they had to risk versus what I have to risk. It's like, for the most part, the biggest thing that I have to risk is people not liking what I have to say. They'll quit following me on Instagram, you know? And so, so I definitely feel responsible and because I call the people around me to do the same thing. And so I don't feel like I can ask people to, to go take a risk at work or go take a risk with your CEO or go say that, you know, we need to hire more black people if I'm not gonna 
do and say the same thing. So, so yeah, so I think the obligation is, is there, but I, but it's also, I mean, it's, it's, it's way more just gratitude and what had to happen for me to occupy this space and what incredible lengths that my parents and grandparents and ancestors, you know, people that, that came here in slave ships, people that watched their kids get lynched, you know, that was, that that's obligation. That's, that's risk. You know, this is, this is, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that I can do anything that I can to move this, move this ball a little bit further. Thank you. Um, the next question says, uh, the commenter says, thank you so much for sharing your important work. Your work speaks eloquently to the experiences of black men navigating the criminal justice system. I'm interested in also hearing about your experiences navigating the world of art, curators, and museums. And this is for you, Omari, but maybe Gisela and Carrie might also have some thoughts on this one. Yeah. Yeah, maybe, um, maybe, well, why don't you all go first and then I'll go. What do you think? I don't know if, uh, Carrie, do you want to uh, answer, since you've, you're doing this exhibition specifically about this topic, and then I, I'm happy to weigh in a little bit in terms of more generally, in terms of museum and curatorial work. Well, for me, um, it's always important um, to think about when I'm curating an exhibition, uh, the work that is being, um, who's making the work that's being exhibited and how um, that is representative or not representative. I will never forget an experience early when I was still in graduate school, um, volunteering as part of my assistantship in a museum. And it was a juried exhibition and we, we got in all the work and I said uh, to the curator, I said, well, are we going to look at, you know, how many women, how many men, how many people of color? And, um, and she replied, no, this, it's, it's a meritocracy and it's completely blind. And I just remember thinking, well, that's not, uh, what a bunch of bullshit. That's what I thought, right? That, that, that there, this notion of a meritocracy is, is utter, uh, uh, is not true, right? That's a fallacy that, that you're not acknowledging um, the systems of power that we're in. So, and especially for this exhibition, it was crucial to include work made by people who are incarcerated or have been incarcerated. Um, and then to think about um, when putting together the public programming of bringing those artists who um, are most uh, closely impacted um, by the system and thinking about whose story um, is being told and, and having, giving, making space uh, for that story to be told by the people affected by it. So not by me. So now I'm gonna stop talking. <laughs> um, that, that's such an interesting anecdote, anecdote that you shared, Carrie, about how, you know, curators approach the selection of artists to have an exhibition. So I think for me, um, and I had a conversation in a panel a couple of weeks ago um, with City Arts Orlando talking about um, uh, being black in the art world. And, uh, you know, it's a, it should be an ongoing conversation because for me as a curator, um, we are, we are telling the stories of the artists whose work we are showing. It's, it's their narrative, right? So I see curators as being sort of conduits to help organize it and shape it and present it, but it's their stories, right? And so sometimes that line between um, amplifying their voice and their story, uh, it's, it's a little bit confusing and blurred with curators trying to impose our own perspectives and narratives. So there is a little bit of a push pull there that I think as much as we are aware of it, it's important to continue engaging and kind of keep ourselves in check in terms of how we present the stories that we present and, and the work that we present, but also uh, in more generally in terms of, of museums in the 21st century and especially in this particular moment is that the responsibility is not, should not be just the curator, it should be in terms of the structure of museums, mu museum administration, you know, not just how many artists of color you're showing in an exhibition, but really how many people of color do you have in leadership? How many people of color do you have on the board? How many donors of color do you have or do you engage or people with different backgrounds and different perspectives and different life experiences because those 
uh, and not just in the curatorial department, but also in, um, in marketing and engagement and outreach and education, right? It has to be a, trans a transformation of the entire structure for it to be open uh, to representing different experiences, right? So curators sometimes may have the best of intentions, but if you don't have the support of, uh, of the museum structure above you uh, that understands the value of doing what we want to do it might be a little bit challenging. And some institutions do a lot better than others in that regard. So I think it's, that's why it's so important that the conversation is ongoing, that that dialogue and keeping ourselves in check and keeping our institutions in check and for artists to also be active in that process, right? Because you're, you need to reclaim some space and some uh, opportunities for amplifying your voice, right? I've learned so much um, today, just listening to Omari talk about his experience that I wouldn't have learned about mass incarceration and the power of art in this particular instance where, where it not be for this particular exhibition, right? So this is important that we do these events and, um, and partner with artists like Omari and like others who have so much to teach us and to, and to tell us about their experience. Yeah, absolutely. And just, you know, my personal experience with um, the, the art world as a whole has been, I mean, I think it's been, it's been pretty positive. It's been, it's been different, you know, commercial galleries have been the most challenging space to enter because they're, for one, they're sales driven and they're sales driven by the top 5% of economic um, wealth. And so it's like, I'm talking about issues that are in direct opposition, often in direct opposition with people that have a lot of money and people that have a lot of money often decide what gets shown, what gets seen, what gets heard. And so, so I think that's been my, I think that's been a little bit of the pushback with the gallery, the commercial gallery Seen. Um, and I think museums have been much more open because I think museums would like to tell a story. They're not so much concerned with are the people that are coming in here going to buy this, <laughs> you know. And so, so I've had a I've had a, a better relationship with museums than with galleries. And you know, with galleries, I, I kind of I be, I mean, hip hop music is my biggest influence as far as art art goes, even so. When I look at the Jay Z's, the Nipsey Hussles, the Kanye West, the Master P's, you know, when I look at the hip hop artists that that rose to um, to acclaim or whatever, I mean, they did it themselves. A lot of the shows that I like, the next exhibit that I'm putting on, I found the space. I'm working out a deal with it. I'm going to curate it myself. It's, and you know, it's like, so I'm going to create a commercial gallery in Nashville and then bring bring people to that. And it's like, if y'all don't want to put it in your commercial gallery, that's cool. <laughs> but when you see it over here, you're probably gonna you're probably gonna reconsider because I, I think that galleries don't understand how viable culture is. It's like the whole, I mean, the the, the whole country is 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 driven by things of culture. And so, so when when artwork does have a narrative, when people can buy in and look at it on their wall, and also it caused discussion there's value to that. And sometimes you gotta lead the, the power structure to that value, um, but, but it's definitely there. So, so long story short, I'm, I'm optimistic. There have been some challenges, especially as far as galleries go, but, um, but I kind of welcome that. Cause I think that, I think that, I think we're in an era where at, at no other time, why not embrace the challenges? Cause everything is about to change anyway, so. Thank you so much, Amari. Uh, the next question is about how you got started. So how did you get started in doing art and do you always paint social issues? Um, yeah, I, I don't always paint social issues, but I did get started. My, uh, I had a high school art teacher, you know, at my senior year of high school, I had to take an art class um, and I took that class and loved it. And I went on to, went to college, I was a math major, but then went back to art um, kind of my third year in, changed majors, and and eventually after the incarceration and everything, I went back to school and graduated with an art degree. But but uh, but yeah, I mean, I just I, I loved it, and when I started painting regularly and feeling what it did for my spirit and therapeutically, then I just painted really really regularly um, before there was a lot of you know money 
involved or anything like that. It just, um, yeah, it just was something that did so much for my spirit that I felt like I had to do. And I think the pieces that are are of social, um, that are social commentary, um, it, that's the same. It's like, that's just something that has to be expressed. So I express that, but um, but definitely they're, they're not always, all of my work isn't necessarily, isn't directly about social justice. So this the shirt that I'm wearing, Need a Hug, is about my next, <laughs> my next exhibit where I'm just painting images of people hugging because I felt like that was what was needed by me. And I, and I think that a lot of people could, could relate to in this moment. So, so yeah, so I would say both. I would say I kind of create whatever is, is naturally in the air. Um, and of course, at the time that, since I started really, you know, creating regularly, which was around 2013 when I got out and while I was in, but there've just been so many things that have consistently come up that have, that I felt like I had to say something about or I was going to explode. So, so yeah, so that's where the social justice work kind of comes in. But, but I'm 100%. Um, yeah, I do commission work. I do kind of what murals, whatever, whatever other things show up. And so. Um, looking at the experiences leading up to your incarceration, do you believe that a deficit in education as a result of class inequality leads to more conflicts with police? It, yes, definitely. Um, that wasn't my personal experience, but you know, 100%. I think, um, I mean, I know that the area, I mean, I work in a predominantly black area and, and I know how that area is policed versus the police that I went to high school, worst the area I went to high school in. Um, and I also know that the interactions with police, it's not only that will you have run-ins, it's what happens when the run-in when the run-in happens. It's like, does the kid, do they call the, the parent of the child and say, come, man, come get this drunk kid that's got, you know, an ounce of weed on him? Or do they take him in, book him and set his bond at 20,000, <laughs> you know? And so, so I think the run-ins, the run-ins happened consistently. There was always kids that I that that went to Vanderbilt or went to Belmont or these are schools in Nashville. So you all may not know these schools, but there were always have been kids that went to prestigious schools that got in the same trouble as 18, 19, 20 year old black kids and in, in difficult neighborhoods got into. But they were held in containers and allowed to grow up through those issues and go on and do whatever instead of getting pinned with a felony at 18, 19, 20. And then you can't get jobs, you can't get housing. There's, you know, you're already uh, so. So yeah, that's um. So 100%. My my experience was not. Um, I don't think that it was lack of education. I think there were some. I think there were some other issues that that contributed. But um. But when there is lack of resources, 100%. That's that is that that sets you up. Yeah, sets you up in a deficit. Thank you so much. We're nearing the end of our time here, but I think we have time for maybe one more question. And um, this is about explaining your paintings to younger audiences, Omari. So for example, your cousin, how, how do you explain your art to younger visitors? And then also, has anyone come up to you and tell you how your paintings made an impact on them? Yeah, yeah, they're both, yes. I mean, there's definitely been some people that, uh, that that really have shared how how they've impacted them, and that that always is incredibly humbling and, and just heartwarming to know that you that you were a part of putting something out out in the world that that landed. Yeah, that's that's um yeah that's always an incredible thing. And and I do a lot of teaching, so I work with kids from. I mean, I've I've worked with kids as young as seven, eight, nine, ten, and up to teens, but. But it's it's actually really easy to explain this stuff to kids. It is really hard to explain it to adults, you know. And and the openness of children of understanding, like, oh yeah, that's really wrong, or that's really hard, or that's really mean. Like, they just they they get it. And so I think we as adults have to look at not teaching that out of them, you know, not not kind of armoring them up with the passes of this is this is just how it is, and it wouldn't be this way if that didn't happen. And so, so yeah, the, the the interactions with young people have been incredible and also really instructive because they always tell me something that I haven't 
considered um, just with that fresh perspective. So, so I found that kids were really, really receptive to these issues and, and that we're doing them a disservice to, to think that they're not ready for it because um, they are. Thank you so much. We have time probably for this really last quick question and there's a lot of love for your poem over in the chat window. So people are wondering if it's published and would there ever be an opportunity to see that poem printed maybe along with the, the painting here in your last screen screenshot? Um, published, no, but the rest of it, yes. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we could figure that out. I, I bet me and Carrie could put our heads together and, and, and man, that thing would be on shelves before you know it if she gets a hold of it. So. <laughs> Yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much to the panelists and to all of our participants today. This is a really wonderful session. Um, check our art gallery website. We have other events and exhibitions uh, throughout the year. So you can always check in there to see what's happening. And then Omari, did you have a website or anything that you wanted to plug before we sign off? Sure. It's omaribooker.com and then Instagram and Facebook, same, just Omari Booker. So yeah, thank you all. And thank you, Carrie and Gisela. Thank you so much. This is great. Thank you so much. And for those who are interested in learning more about Four Freedoms, you can go to four, F-O-R, freedoms.org and see what they're doing this year and how you can get involved. Wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, guys. That was awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank I you feel all. like yeah, we was... could we could keep talking for another two hours. That was Absolutely. fantastic. Yeah, I thought it went well. So yeah. I um so you guys was it on like